All right, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, open source and broadcast. Um, feel free to interrupt me or tell me I'm speaking too quickly or too slowly. Um, don't mind. Um, so to begin with, quickly, I'll try and narrow what I'm going to call broadcast, because if I don't, we'll be here all day. Um, and I'll call this television. Yes, there's radio. And I'll call this television delivered over some sort of managed RF spectrum, or, well, in fact, not managed, in fact, licensed RF spectrum, or managed IPTV or cable network. And that's, these lines are obviously getting blurred in this day and age. And, um, and about this time, somebody usually comes to me and says, actually, you know, I don't own a TV, and therefore television is dead. And I usually reply, um, I don't own a Mac, but Macs aren't dead. Um, but yes, the lines are getting blurred, and if I, if I don't restrict what I re restrict it to, we'll, we'll be here all day. So yes, in the blurb, in the presentation, in the sort of introduction, I said there's very little use of FOSS in broadcast. And to be honest, it's in some ways, we're in, say, I don't know, 1995, 96, that sort of era where we're in the sort of lowest days of wind tail dominance in server rooms, if you, if you try to parallel with the IT industry. Uh, broadcast has, well, maybe less so these days, but certainly in the past, large budgets, and was a big fan of sort of big engineering solutions. The other issue is there's a history, there's a legacy of analog, and I might touch on that a bit later. Uh, lots of guys are scared of the command line in the industry. But that said, changes on the way. There's a, there's a sort of bigger push in the industry towards IT based workflows and in, in fact I would say certainly in Scandinavia and Norway as well it, it was a big um, a big leader in this area many companies um, doing sort of IT based broadcast things VizRT, TVIPS, uh, Tanberg even you know came from Norway so it's, it's actually certainly in other parts of the world we're nowhere near as, as advanced as we are here um, on the other hand, a lot of consumer devices, certainly set-top boxes galore, pretty much all, I would say, universally now run Linux, except maybe the Microsoft ones. But even then, certainly in the UK, what they did was um, the Microsoft stack was being such a big problem that they reflashed 400,000 boxes over the air with Linux. Um, but that said, none of this is exposed to the end user, certainly on the consumer end, that's for... Um, I'm going to use the phrase uh, conditional access purposes, which isn't the same as DRM, but um, is closely intertwined. And that's probably the big reason it's not exposed to the end user. Um, conditional access being checking if you've paid for the service, and DRM being managing the serv controlling the content that you've bought. And those, those, whilst it does use a similar technology stack, those are two different things. And there are some operators around the world that do one but not the other. Certainly they do conditional access, but they don't do the DRM bit. So what's the upside? Um, the broadcast chain is really segmented into different pieces. So you can take free and open source applications and stick them into place. It's very, very heavily standards based. Um, probably the most famous of which is DVB, but there's many others, including um, SMPTE in the more professional domain, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. And as I said, there's more convergence with the IT industry and IT standards. Certainly IPTV inherently is more aware of open source than traditional broadcasting. I've given this presentation over a number of years and it's certainly changed, but Mac, when the, I think the first time I gave this presentation was in FOSDEM 2011 or maybe 2012. And back then when I was going, yep, oh, sorry. Yep. Could you slow down a bit? So, yep, sorry. Um, back then, certainly there was a, a, a sort of there was much less knowledge about sort of IT, using even, you know, even generic x86 equipment. There was a lot less of that. It was all very hardware focused. But the biggest thing has got to be the passionate and dedicated enthusiasts, and they, they make things happen. And some of them sit in this room, you know, and that's really how you get things done. So unfortunately, a lot of this does talk, is. Socially, there's a lot of social aspects in the industry. Uh, free and open source software has always been very good at making sort of tools, and that, that kind of times well, very well with the Unix philosophy of you know do do one thing and do it well. But sadly, it doesn't really fit well in the broadcast world. Um, I know certainly a few of you have been to the international broadcast convention. It's a massive trade show, you know, 50,000 people, and everything that's there. It's about being big. It's about being shiny. It's being about this. And unfortunately, we're still in an age in broadcast where Free is not considered good. Um, 
there are already good preconceptions about sort of products, and that's just literally based on features and price. And then again, it's about finding the right people in a broadcaster, usually in a small to mid-sized broadcaster who can push free and open source. And in fact, in most places, it's actually one or two people who really push it and actually make it happen. Um, so towards the beginning, people said to me, oh, yeah, you, should, you know, you should do this, you should do this. And expecting other people to re sort of redesign their architecture around, around open source, free and open source software. And that's really not going to happen, certainly not in a 24-hour um, industry like broadcasting. People are not going to rebuild their chains. People are not going to make day-to-day -day changes. And unfortunately, in reality, as I'll touch on a bit later, the people that, by the time people are looking into free and open source software and broadcasting, it's because they've exhausted everything on the market. And then you get very, very, very niche, very, very niche sort of requests that people haven't found in the market. And my personal opinion, at least, which you know you can feel free to disagree with, it does require some sort of dictatorial attitude to say, yes, you know you have your niche case, but at the end of the day, we need to focus on what most people want and become a jack of all trades, a master of none. And in many cases, that does mean less is more in terms of features. Maybe fewer features is more. I should say, um, make it clear to people, you know, what this does and how they can use it in their in their professional environment, because. At the end of the day, um, the, you know, if, if you as an engineer go and choose, I don't know, let's say Tanberg, because they don't really exist anymore, and if Tanberg fails, it's Tanberg's fault. Whereas you as an engineer, if you choose open source and open source fails, it's your fault. And there's a big difference there. So people do need to feel comfortable with what they're doing because this does run 24 7 mission critical things in many cases. So a lot of the open source. Uh, free and open source software in broadcasting is raced based around these two projects. Um, first is X264. It's a best in class H264 AVC encoder. In reality, that means it wins in a lot of the codec comparisons between commercial alternatives. It's used in a variety of different industries web. So, YouTube, Facebook, Netflix are the big ones, Vimeo as well for web and pretty much every single other place. Uh, Blu-ray, so I worked on the Blu-ray uh, support many years ago, and Warner Brothers released pretty big titles We're using, encoded with X264. Uh, the Friends box set, I think it must be about 1500 knock, something like that. It's a full, you know, I think 12 or 13 disc set. You know, they really, you know, the person there actually you know, really went out on a limb and said, you know, we're going to use open source. And in fact, nobody's actually, there have been no technical issues at all with the uh, Encoding the other on that area, which which goes to show really that you can you can push your really really top tier titles that people are spending you know for a Blu-ray disc quite a serious amount of money on, and actually encode that with open source and it will work well. Uh, the other sort of new area is cloud gaming. Um, there's the PlayStation 4. It's quite interesting. Um, that's where if you're not aware, you play a game in the cloud and that's compressed over a low latency feed and displayed to you. Uh, Steam has also started doing that with X264 and etc. because there's a myriad of other things people do with X264. The other big one is um, FFmpeg and FFmbc, the latter FFmbc being a uh, broadcast fork of FFmpeg. FFmpeg is used widely on the web. Um, broadcast and post-production seem to prefer FFmbc and there are lots of technical reasons why. Uh, I can talk a bit about that afterwards. So to go through some of the different projects in open source that people use um, day to day, one of the big ones is Casper CG. It was developed uh, in, a, in a neighboring Sweden. Um, they had problems with um, existing graphics software, that we call it. Um, and at the time, anyway, it was based on Flash. Nowadays, there are HTML5 components. And they use it to generate graphic. They use it for pretty much everything on every broadcast. <laughs> Uh, it's used 24/7 on six channels. It's used for all the big broadcasts: Melody Festival, the World Cup, the news, day-to-day -day sort of continuity. So, what's coming up next? Subtitling, that logo insertion. I mean, literally everything. And that's all completely open-source software. Uh, another one of the big deployments is uh, the French ISP Free. So they're quite similar to Altibox, I would say, in that they focus quite heavily on their sort of set-top box as a sort of 
for want of a better phrase, a sort of gateway to content in the home. So that can be broadcast television content, sort of um, even web content. And they were they're very they're quite heavily parallel to Altibox. Um, they so they serve a much larger market, five million homes. So they're broadcast television head end. So a head end, for, if you're not aware, is a, a system. Well, sort of. I don't know, a region in a data center that receives incoming feeds from broadcasters that can be uncompressed, compressed in all different types and pushes that over an IPT or some sort of broadcast network. What's unique about their head end is it's entirely based on open source. And I, I, I'm, well, I'm certain there's no other sort of operation in the world like it. And that head end was written by one of the founders of VLC. So all the PSB, uh, public service broadcasting, and commercial channels are encoded with X264, the major channels. Uh, so they're equivalent of NRK, they're equivalent of TV2. Um, at quite a, you know, quite a serious scale. And to be honest, the reason they only did this at the beginning was they, they had a budget of about, oh, I don't know, 500 euros per channel at the beginning, back in the MPEG-2 days. So they really had no choice. But they've really shown that open source, free and open source software can be very stable. Um, running for years without problems and at a very high quality, and they've even started. They even sort of interact. They can show it can interact with more proprietary components such as the conditional access scrambling systems, which they're required to do on certain channels. Uh, the, the BBC also have a big part in open source and broadcast. So they have something a product called Raven, and uh, by product uh, they they use the term product to mean an internal uh, tool, an internal sort of application that can be used throughout the organization. And actually, that's BBC News, it should really say. Um, they, they needed to re replace old videotape recorders in their production vehicles as a result of um, moving to high definition. And they, they decided to build a, a videotape recorder, a VTR, and a playout server. So that takes um, material nowadays stored on file, but traditionally it would have also been stored on tape, and plays that out to air um, if it's a remote if it's a remote deployment, it plays it out to a satellite link. And that's all based around FFMBC. And in fact, they probably um, take it to a bit of an extreme about FFMBC, and they go quite far with the Unix philosophy um, in the sense that if you scrub on the timeline in their application, it will launch a new FFMBC process. Everything is piped throughout the application, which is quite an interesting way of doing it. Um, what's interesting, it's just a generic x86 box with a um, Blackmagic SDI, I'll talk about that in a minute, actually. Um, and it's deployed widely. I think they've published, they say that they have something like 500 now on their website. It must be more by now. So, And they've extended it a lot to do a lot of things that traditional broadcast equipment can't do, so metadata things, so tagging content in the field, and, and just a huge variety of things. And it's used for all the big events. So the news during the Olympic Games was broadcast from the Olympic Park. Um, it was that was used for play out uh, when the Queen of England had her 60th anniversary, the Jubilee. It was used for all the big. Um, there was a big spectacle, and they had all the, and it was used for all the all the sort of play out of the uh, recorded content. And I think it's probably the largest user free and open source software uh, in the whole of the broadcasting in terms of numbers of viewers. I'd say tens, maybe twenties, twenty mil, you know, millions of people watch BBC News in the UK and abroad. And I go and I go to meetings, and, and then I, I say uh, people say to me, "Oh yeah, we don't um, we don't think this open source software is good enough. We'll use it maybe in Asia or in India, but we can't use it in Europe. It's not good enough." And then at, at one meeting in particular, um, BBC News was playing in the background, and I say, oh, "You know, you, you keep saying it's not good enough, but what do you think is actually playing out all this content to, you know, all this this you know stuff to millions of people around the world and in the background?" And it almost certainly was a Raven. Uh, so that's one of the ravens. I think that's in the Olympic Park. Um, so the idea is it can ingest all sorts of content. So you can see a card readers at the front. And I'll talk a bit more about card readers, because uh, memory cards, because those are quite interesting uh, afterwards. Because those are all consumer memory cards. And one thing Linux yet doesn't support is a professional memory cards. So I'll talk about that in a second. And you can see these are all just, they're not even actually one new servers. They're actually generic sort of low pro sort of low height mini ITX machines so they can put two side by side. So there's something I have to I tell broadcasters a lot at meetings. Um, 
without open source software, a lot of your channels would just look like this. Um, it's something I really, really push to them. If you, you know, there aren't press releases, there is no big sort of shong and dance about open source. It sits there in the background, but without it, certainly the BBC, certainly SVT, I know a few of you were there, would, um, would you know, would say, our channels would look like this if it wasn't, well, without the cursor, obviously, um, but uh, without open source. So, I, I, you know, it's something I try to emphasize, is try and work on projects for the 99% if you do want to get things to happen in broadcast, and not ignore, but maybe play down the features for the sort of point, uh, maybe you need a few more noughts, point no, 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 one percent because, okay, you can come to me and say, yeah, I need a screen grabber that can somehow output me a modulated stream, but this is not what people do in broadcast. It is a segmented thing, and if you do want to, you know, get people to use things in the broadcast industry, you have to you have to sort of make it fit with an in existing infrastructure. It's a conservative industry. Uh, so the other thing I'm, I'm quite interested in uh, is memory cards, and, the, and uh, these are professional memory cards. So on the left is the Panasonic card. It's a P2 card. It's card bus based. And on the right is a Sony, the Sony version, so the two big camera manufacturers that you would, they would use. In the past it would be tape, now they use these memory cards that are some sort of solid state RAID underneath in various shapes or form. So the, right, the one on the right is Express Cards based. So Linux doesn't have support for any of these yet. Uh, so first of all I made a big GP, so a lot of the card readers do run Linux, so I made a GPR request. Um, and I got a massive code drop. There was a crazy mess. We've all commented in Japanese, but it works. Um, it's just old and needs updating, and it was all the codes all there. I'm maybe not the person to upgrade all the uh, internal kernel um, APIs and ABIs, but it's there and it could be supported. So SSX was more of a SXX was more of a SF. I can't never say this right. SXS SYS yeah. Um, reverse engineering was. Um, more of a complex issue, because I got some code from Sony, but not everything was there, and for reasons I don't quite understand from a GPL perspective, whether they're allowed to do some sort of NVIDIA-style thing. But it, it was, but it wasn't, because there, there didn't seem to be a separate binary, a separate sort of unit that was DL open, so were they allowed to just include code that just wasn't there? But anyway, I was, didn't really want to argue with them, so I decided to reverse engineer it. Um, what it did was use QEMU and a machine with an IOMMU. And what I could do then was install Windows XP inside that virtual machine and the SBIS drivers. And I could then pass through the PCI device and I could start dumping all the... Oh, and so Windows, Windows picked it up as a block device. And you can see, you know, this numbers of blocks, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think it was a block size, I think. 1024, something like that. Maybe it was 2048. And then, so as a result, I can then start individually reading blocks. And because I can then patch QEMU, I can start dumping the reads and writes to the base address, PCI base address register. And then seeing how that sort of, if, I, if, I, if I'm looking for block one and block two, block three, block four. And as a result, I could then um, write a driver. Um, so what you do is you just write to a few memory addresses, the block address you want. And then you sort of, there's a sort of status, there's a sort of command register and you just send, you just write one to it. You get an into oh you write you write your DMA memory address and uh, you can't remember if you write the length but anyway um, so and you set a command register and then you get an interrupt from the card and then that memory address then has the uh, the data you need and it actually worked quite well um, the bit that I'm struggling with is the uh, works well but it has a mem copy in it at the moment which obviously is not optimal I want to use DMA directly uh, I did ask on the mailing list if anyone was interested in helping me get this into mainline. Uh, sadly, no response, but um, it doesn't use normal scatter gather DMA like a normal device. It just wants sort of one slab of DMA. I've tried to force it to use scatter gather, but it didn't, wasn't really interested. So you can, either, you can either write single blocks or you have to write sort of continual, continual number of blocks. But it works, and actually it was, it was a bit of an anticlimax, to be honest, because I expect there's a lot more reverse engineering necessary, but it does, does work. Um, that was the rig, basically. Uh, taking the card apart, so if you probably can't see very well, but the card is just a bunch of memory modules. And that's available as well on GitHub. 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now is uh, what I mostly work on, which is the open broadcast encoder. So I need to give an introduction to what broadcast encoders do. Um, so they encode uh, video from what in what's, an, what's called a serial digital interface. It's a coaxial cable. I think it's a it's coaxial cable, or sometimes it's available as fiber optic. And that's usually to a transport stream, an MPEG transport stream, so 188 byte packets. And usually that contains MPEG 2 or MPEG 4 video. Uh, there's two general types of sort of encoding that's done very loosely. Uh, contribution from, say, I don't know, a sports ground to a studio, or distribution from a broadcast to the home. There's also things in between, such as uh, contributions from broadcasters to uh, operators if, if the operator doesn't directly pick the feed up from the broadcasters. And there's also transcoders, which operate in the compressed domain. That's it, at least in traditional broadcasting, that's a transport stream to transport stream. Uh, for example, when NRK HD used to broadcast, and I think about maximum 12 megabits, that could be a bit too much for the allocated bandwidth on a standard ADSL connection. So they used to use transcoders to sort of lower that a little bit. Usually these are ASIC based or FPGA based. Um, there's a lot of buzz about doing this on the GPU, and I have to go to a lot of broadcasters that should know better and say, uh, this is not realistic. Encoding is a serial process. GPUs are good at doing heavily, heavily, embarrassingly parallel tasks. So the Open Broadcast Encoder, which has quite a strong root in Norway, um, originally formed help with help from NextGentile and various others around the world to build a professional broadcast grade open source encoder on commodity hardware. Uh, this was just based with you know, various frustration with existing equipment, which I could talk about maybe a bit more privately. <laughs> maybe not necessarily good, uh, good to talk about on camera, but um, one of the issues was they were tough told various people who helped out there were just told to buy new equipment when the current one had problems, which was a bit ridiculous. They paid quite serious amounts of money, sort of up to and including 20, up to maybe oh, no, up to twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 for one of these bits of equipment, probably even more in Norway, I guess. Um, and, you know, not getting the sort of, the, the being locked in for a start and not getting the sort of support they need. And, and also to over, overall sort of improve picture quality and general control over equipment and, and I guess try to try new things. And that's actually only something we've started doing recently is trying new things that other manufacturers don't really have. So technical issues. Um, there are issues with capturing SDI. You use a PCI card. Now, mm, virtually all of them use V4L2, which is a bit unfortunate because um, you get your video from V4L2 and your audio from ALSA. These are two different file descriptors. In a broadcast, you would like to stay in sync. You can never open these two file descriptors at the same time. Um, and there's no master clock. There is, you can use system clock, but it's not ideal. You would rather have a hard, because in SDI, audio and video is interleaved at a byte level. Well, at a, actually, in fact, at a line level, but in practice, as a software developer, you deal with it in a, as a byte level. And as a result, you are always out of sync. And I've, unfortunately, I have proposed something to the V4 kernel people, but they were not happy. Um, I proposed V4L2 allows you to have multiple buffers in your, in your callback, well, in your, in your sort of after you've polled. You can get multiple buffers, but buffers in. But then um, I propose this is designed to be used for video, so you can have multiple planes of video. I'm not sure. I can't remember the reason why the different devices want to do that, but they do. Um, I suggested posting, putting audio in one of those, but unfortunately the maintainer vetoed that, which is unfortunate because there are various benefits that having a large marketplace of capture cards has. The other important thing is. Um, Obviously, broadcast live encoding has to be in real time, and I've, there are patches that I sort of maintain a bit that um, are there to basically they buffer frames and then control the speed of encoding to make sure that there's a hard real time hit. So we we make heavy use of SIMD, uh, SSE, AVX, AVX2, and also some MMX, and we use an abstraction layer called X264 ASM. Pretty much all the uh, open source media projects use it now. I would say. Uh, libvpx, ffmpeg, and that's an abstraction layer that tries to, to use as um, some sort of, it's not inline assembly, but it's an external file and still has 
it just uses, it just calls your register, register zero, register all your registers are indexed by zero, one, two, three, four, five, or or if it's an MMX register, M, MMX or FCC register, M zero, M one, M two, M three, M four, M five, and you completely ignore the underlying ABI underneath. So usually you'd have to write code for the Unix thirty two ABI, the Windows thirty two, uh, Windows thirty two, Windows sixty four, which is a bit trickier, and uh, Unix sixty four, but the assembling, assembly layer can figure out the entirety uh, of all the sort of underlying ABI knowledge underneath. And there's loads and loads of macros to aid in this. Uh, this is actually, this, this layer I think is now ISC licensed, so um, there's no other, there's a, you can use, people do use it in proprietary software. I think I'm right in saying it was ISC licensed because Flash wanted to use it many years ago, but I I'm, might be wrong there. Um, the other important thing is um, if you don't deliver a standards compliant stream, your random box from China um, will fail and we've actually had issues with that which I'll probably have to talk about off camera, but well, that were not good to say the least. Um, so yeah, I am wearing a Videoland t-shirt. Um, X264 is part of the Videoland project, but it's not the best known part which is VLC. And one of the questions I always get is, why don't you just do this in existing um, existing libraries, even though we always do work with existing libraries? A lot of these sort of toolkits are quite restrictive in the professional domain. Probably the most important thing is uh, teletext or closed captioning. So teletext is used for subtitling in Europe. Still, even, even in areas such as the UK where, where in principle we don't have teletext, the underlying professional infrastructure is still teletext based. Um, or closed captioning. These can, these well, these are, are legal requirements and have to be. They can't exactly fail. Uh, the other idea, or the other problem in meetings is sort of it's kept, it's quite difficult to convince end users to sort of use an application. This, this is what I use to play my videos on at home, and you're telling me this can, this application can now go and run big television channels. It's not easy. Not to mention the internal architecture changes relatively regularly. And there's less of a focus, say, on um, professional uses. That said, I you know, we still send patches back where possible. One thing we're probably going to end up using is something called UPipe. It's a um, brand new framework because we don't have enough. Um, no, but it, it's more focused about around actually playing professional content and building professional infrastructure. Um, VLC, FMPEG, Gstream, a, a lot of them will acknowledge that their goal is to play every single file out there irrespective of how broken it is. And that's actually caused, uh, certainly a lot of the code to try and play broken files has caused a lot of issues in the professional domain. And it's one reason FMPEG has been forked to FMBC. Uh, UPipe, you, well, I should have given a URL, but it's upipe.org, um, is a possible way of trying to sort this all out try and focus a bit more on professional things. Um, and it, it uses more more than, oh, it doesn't, so the author, so the author built the free head end, which I talked about. Um, it focuses more on sort of modern techniques such as um, lockless queues, using sort of callbacks. Uh, I can't remember, that's, oh, trying to focus more on multi-core issues, not putting random locks in when you don't need them, that sort of thing. Uh, so one of the um, so one of the channels that was first interested in OBE was FreeCanal, and I thought it was quite interesting because they have a big focus on open source. So they're a community access channel available on Rix TV, and I think also on Altibox, if I'm right. So their play out on encoding is entirely open source, um, and we send feeds to Rix TV over the public internet, um, along with for their correction which is, I think, pretty unique for, it is quite, for, this, this, this sort of technique is used for sort of sending pictures from, I don't know, say, Beirut or somewhere like that, sent over the public internet nowadays because satellite feeds are sort of very expensive, um, sent over the public internet nowadays. Uh, most of the broadcasters do this, but I know not of any sort of um, full-form TV channels which are sent over the public internet. In the main, this works very well. Um, there's not much packet loss, well, um, except for issues on the network, I think, is a real issue. And I think this is the first digital terrestrial channel encoded with open source. I think this was the th our third or fourth uh, encoder that we did. 
back, I think it was in 2011 or something like that. Um, so a real baptism of fire was in Vietnam. Um, I got a call one day um, from uh, the CTO, I think it was at the time. They're a national pay TV and satellite platform. And they had to upgrade their channel portfolio in a very short space of time. Um, have many hundreds of encoders all built on commodity hardware. Uh, on commodity hardware. Um, this was encoding done at scale. And it was, a, it was a real sort of, this was moving from single digit numbers of channels to triple digit numbers of channels overnight, literally. Um, yes, in broadcast we have lots of cool looking control rooms, so all of those channels are encoded with open source. All of those, um, that's, that's, that's the control room that deals more with the broadcast side. So the videos, content, and maybe dealing with issues on the video side. This is a control that deals with more of the transmitter side, so you can see a little bit here. The satellite network and possibly the, the transmitter network is in some of these pictures with sort of a smaller focus on the um, content. Um, for those who are interested, this is a pretty state-of-the-art platform, actually. I would say it's a DVB-T2 single frequency network, so only a single frequency is used. and. Uh, as opposed to multi-frequency networks, which are more common. I think it's the second single frequency network in the world. In DVB-T2, I think Finland was the first. Um, and it, it's quite interesting because um, it allows you to have very, very small antennas, and they can also put antennas in cars and have very strong signals. If you did that currently, um, you'd move around different parts of, a, of the country, and different regions have different sort of... Um, well, different, different channels are on. So NRK, so for example, would be on a different frequency depending on where you are. Uh, and I believe that's for historical reasons and for geographical reasons because of spillover between different countries. Also, oh, various platform operators, various different uh, service providers, um, mostly contribution providers. They're not really big fans of talking about the use of open source. Um, one of the ones who does is the, are the Icelandic broadcasters. Um, they use it for our software for sending uh, feeds in the football league between stadiums and the main broadcaster. Uh, RUV, the Icelandic state broadcaster, also uses it in its just literally a generic server in its vehicles. And unfortunately, uh, I have to be vague, but there are other well known sports and news contribution feeds around the world which use our stuff. And by now, I think we have about 300 to 400 channels. So to focus a bit more on um, the commercial side, productification, what does that actually mean? Um, it means trying to package this up in such a way that we can sort of provide this as a commercial software package to broadcasters. And in practice, this means giving them web, a web interface and an SNMP interface. And that wraps around the open source core. But I would hasten to add, um, there still actually is I think no additional functionality in the commercial version, which I'm not personally, I don't know. It's not what everyone would do, but that's how it is. What this does allow people to do, though, is, is to do things when they, um, build their when they order equipment from the ground up and actually design their hardware around their use cases. So, for example, in vehicles, people would like DC input. They do not want to use an inverter for no reason because you plug your, your AC input back into the box and the, the box probably converts it back to DC. It's pointless. They give it an unregulated input and they can do that. You know, In-car computing is a solved problem. Um, sizes. Um, size of equipment is also interesting. We have a few pieces of equipment that are in street furniture attached to fiber networks. Um, and so we could build ones which are very thin, very, very shallow, so quarter depth on new units. Or we could even build half depth, a uh, half width units, so units which are very thin, so we can put two side by side. And again, it's a sort of, you can tell people, people are shocked to realize that I give them the root password. I, you know, if, if they have equipment, it's, it's not an appliance. They can do what they like on these things. Whereas currently they buy an appliance and they're only able to sort of touch it and poke it a little bit. And I guess this sort of is part of the slow move towards IT-based broadcast infrastructures. So there's an, there's an elephant in a room that I've not really talked about. 
Um, I think you can guess what it is. Um, so, by the way, that's um, for those who are interested, that's a Banksy, and um, Banksy is from uh, Bristol, where we're based, so that's why I thought I'd put that in. Uh, so, yeah, patents. It's fair to say um, audio and video codecs are heavily patented. Um, people will want fees, shall we say, for the sale of these codecs and for transmission uh, for broadcast with such codecs. Whether, those, whether those, they have the justification for doing that legally, I'm not going to dwell on because I'm not a lawyer, but they will come and ask for their money at some point, and there is not much you can do, I would say. It says sale fees necessary. It should say sale fees not necessary for source code distribution. Um, so we ship, we ship source code at the moment for our open source stuff. We don't ship any binaries. And I have it confirmed from the license holders that they, they don't consider that a complete product as source code, and therefore such a thing wouldn't require any sales fees. In our commercial product, we do pay the sale fees. Um, it's up to the broadcaster to pay transmit fees. This is like any other product, though it's funny when you go to them, they've been using so-and-so commercial products and assume the transmit fees have been paid. Uh, but suddenly, when open source is involved, oh, the transmit fees are now a big, of big importance, even though they've never been paid them. They've never paid them before. But this kind of goes back to the whole idea that the system is a little bit shaky. Many do not pay the transmit fees anyway. I think they just either ignore them. But certainly, American companies, they will, they will be insistent. Um, and I don't blame them in America because in America, you could be in serious trouble. In Europe, it's a mixed bag. Some do, some don't. So there's a sort of, I don't know, I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to touch on some of the technical aspects, but also on a sort of bigger picture aspect. And what I like to try and explain to broadcasters is we're trying to be a bit like Firefox in the IE6 days. Come along and be the alternative that's open source and draw our line in the sand somewhere. Certainly, I know um, there are so there are lots of issues in broadcast with interoperability, and that kind of has parallels to the sort of IE6 days when there were problems with web standards. The broadcast industry's solution at the moment is just to throw more money at problems, and to be honest, they could do that for a while, but there are better ways. And if we can draw our line in the sand and say, we can be different like Firefox, um, we could actually you know, in principle, we could actually try and push and change because now, yes, Firefox came along, I think it was maybe what, late 90s, they really, and in the early 2000s, came along and said, you can do browsers different. But now we have an entire spectrum of browsers with all different models, you know, you've got Chrome, you've got Safari, you know, they share bits of code, they're, they're, they're sort of in between proprietary and open source, and, you know, there are benefits, pros and cons to each. WebKit's, you know, very interesting because you have two companies who are at each other's throats, Google and Apple but they share the same underlying rendering engine. And in, in principle, that could, wouldn't happen in broadcast. Certainly, um, companies who are at each other's throats sharing a major chunk of source code ain't going to happen, but it could happen. Um, don't usually t explain this one to broadcasters because we don't really know what GCC and LLVM is, but um, GCC showed that open source compilers work and Arguably, the open source development model is the best for developing compilers compared to, say, your MSVCs. But LLVM you know, can show that there are mixed models that could work. I mean, I'm not going to sort of say you know, one's better than the other, but LLVM has proven itself to be very useful in a number of areas, certainly with integration with development environments. But then again, it has downsides, such as, I guess, in the news last week, it was Swift. You know, Swift is based on LLVM, but in principle, it's an entire lock-in language. There is, it's not open source at all. All the modules are closed source. And I guess this goes back to some of the last point. Um, so there's a lot of broadcast manufacturers that use LGPL code, and then they just say, ah, we've, we've got this new feature. And then if you're lucky, they'll mention it's LGPL somewhere in a wadge of paperwork. But in a lot of cases, they don't. Um, and that's a bit unfortunate, to be honest. And is the sad reason why a lot of our stuff is GPL. They, they just can't, it, it goes both ways. We can take contributions, say, from the BBC's Raven very easily, but if we wanted to integrate something proprietary, that makes it a lot harder. 
Um, the other thing to try and get more people to use, to, to use open source in broadcast is events such as this. This basically involves telling open source people about broadcasting and then telling broadcasting people about open source. And, and you know, and we have these at uh, major industry forums every year. I know Michael helped organize the one in the US. Uh, I, I usually organize the one in Amsterdam at the International Broadcasting Convention. Um, we have cooperation from various broadcasters, so usually the BBC are there, uh, Swedish TV are there, etc. Um, I think I have any more. I don't think I have anything more to say. So thanks a lot for having me. Small question. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. What kind of codexes uh, would best to use for um, broadcasting uh, without patent problems? Um, the one that the one that's being pushed at the moment is. Okay, I should have mentioned this a bit actually, because uh, it's quite. It's literally working on it a lot in the last week. Um, VP8, VP9, and Opus. The problem is the VP9 encoder is still too slow. It's, it, I think it's still in sort of seconds per frame territory, so nowhere near frames per second. VP8 is usable, but if you may remember, Google said it was patent free and then signed a deal with the MPEG LA to license their patents. Um, so that's one issue. I'm not sh I personally do not believe there is such thing as a patent free video codec in all jurisdictions. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the direct project? And yes, I, I should have. I should have um, mentioned them as well. So yes. Yes. The oh. direct project is very interesting. It's have uh, they got it down to uh, sub seconds per frame? Yes. Yeah. No? Yes, but there are other issues I will talk about off camera with that. Uh, so yeah, the other so that's the video for for Opus. We are trying to get. Um, so the Opus codec is the sort of successor to Ogvorbis, and that's in principle a patent-free audio codec. We're trying to get that standardized in MPEG transport stream, and we should have got a response by two days ago, because I had a, we submitted it, I think, early May, and they have 30 days to reply, um, and they haven't, so we'll see. But I would like to get rid of one of the proprietary audio codecs and use Opus. And what's quite, what's quite pleasing is none of the broadcasters have objected to it yet. So in principle, we could drop AAC and use Opus end-to-end, -end, which would be really nice. It's one small step. Oh, the other thing is, oh, MPEG-2 patents will expire soon, so that's also a possibility. And then and, and, and I, was, I, was I was speaking to the Chrome development team, and they said, oh, but MPEG-2 patents have expired. You have to put MPEG-2 in Chrome, and there were some unhappy looks. <laughs> but yeah. Dirac, um, yes, Dirac is useful in certain environments, but I don't think it's, it's not been commercially successful compared to JPEG-2000. JPEG-2000 is also considered patent-free, but is um, I have not seen any real-time software applications. I've seen them all hardware-based. I think I'm right in saying. I could have also meant, I, yeah, it's because I tried to restrict the scope a bit. So there is another French, uh, French university project to do uh, open source digital cinema. And digital cinema uses JPEG 2000. So that's of interest. I mean, at the moment, it's because the digital cinema stuff is so full of DRM, um, you have to pay, you know, like, Ten thousand dollars to get your film certif you know, correctly key signed with the correct blah 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 blah, and that could be more than the cost of the entire film in a lot of cases. Certainly with modern cameras. So what people used to do in the past is ship a physical Blu-ray player to the cinema, and, and not, um, as a result of this, and because you know Blu-ray players, what you could get one for maybe hundred hundred and fifty dollars, and that was much cheaper than going through all the DRM mess. But what the French government want to do is have a project where 
digital films for small companies can be sent to cinemas, and cinemas can use VLC to play those and have the full functionality. And what's actually quite interesting is VLC has gone LGPL now. So um, this sort of opens the door towards being able to inject a key into, the, into VLC. And you're starting to enter controversial territory there. I, I don't have an opinion either way. Um, I'm on the fence. I mean, you could be, people could start playing um, heavily DRM files with VLC. And whether that should be a goal of VLC, I'm not one to judge. Yeah. Another question. Yep. You mentioned the Free Canal, yep. uh, which is one of the partners of Nuke. Yep. Uh, how is it using free software? And so they're using free software to play out there. So they, they use to for recorded material. They use uh, something called Melt. I should have actually mentioned them anyway. It's very similar to what the BBC Raven thing does. It takes files and plays them out over an SDI interface, so an uncompressed interface. And it does scheduling and it does various other things. That's already open source. People, I use it in my lab actually to play files out to various places. And then that goes into our stuff. Um, and our stuff does the compression, it does the forward error correction, and then we send that over the public internet to the MUX operator, to the uh, controls operators. I think it's. Uh, and the Oslo Broadcasting Center, and that's fed into the national platform. I think I'm right in saying that FreeCanon is encrypted on the DTT network. Okay, I don't know why that's the case, but I think there's some legal reasons why that's the case. Really? Okay. Maybe we can talk about that later. FreeCanon is encrypted because RixTV want to limit the amount of unencrypted channels on RixTV to okay. the absolute minimum, so only NRK is uh, unencrypted. Okay. There is no legal reason, there is no practical reason, it's just a wish to make sure people want to have a card. Okay, I'm not going to... I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. Okay, that's just unfortunate. Uh, I believe it's free on Altibox, is that right? So yeah, I was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Use Altibox, I don't know. I'm not going to... Uh, if you happen to have 5 yes. There's a web stream, no? You could, you could use, you could, no? All right. Okay, maybe the web stream is only for development purposes then. But I, I have a web stream, but that's maybe not public. One of the interesting things is what you could do on Free Canal is, um, which we were discussing yesterday, was um, add new services, so new teletext services, new, or you could go down the more modern route where they have interactive web stuff on Freakon Island because we do have space on the MUX. We have, I think we send 1.8 megabits and we allocated 2 megabits, so we have 200 kilobits spare that we could do stuff with. There was an interesting proposal yesterday, <laughs> if you were at dinner, which was, uh, if you remember, Michael. So Dora wants to um, write a computer vision software that uh, checks, uh, recognizes people's faces, and then if you press, if you use, go on a certain teletext page, you can add a beard or a moustache to them using the teletext blocks, which I think is a brilliant idea, personally. <laughs> but yeah, but it, it is an, it's an interesting platform. Well, I have talked a bit about um, sort of the um, sort of community side, but for me, anyway, at the beginning, I, I you know really like the idea of community television. But for me, it was a really cool place where I, I was able to add new features like forward error correction. We had problems. I can upgrade to new, I can add new features and try them out on a production network, which is good. And actually, Freak and Island has helped a lot with us um, with just being able to try new stuff and not breaking things too badly, except in one instance, but I can't talk about it Pop on camera. <laughs> More questions? No? Okay. I guess you are done. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>